sweet it is to be plunged to victory. Amen? There's more verses to that song, but as there are in so many of them that we have in the book, but we just had those two printed, first and first and third, wasn't it, Joanne? Yeah. I love the second one. Guy, you know, and he, he finds Jesus and he's healed. Yeah, I like it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the uh, <clears throat> wonderful day you've given us today already. How beautiful these days are now in the fall. We look ahead to celebrating your birth. And uh, but before that, we're going to have Thanksgiving. And Lord, you just remind us at Thanksgiving of all the blessings that you just pile on us, pile after pile of blessings during the year. And uh, but we're reminded that those blessings are given to us for a reason, and that is so we can be a blessing to others. And that, and that this class itself is a blessing. And it's so wonderful that you've given us all of your people in the body of Christ, your, your body, to share with each other our lives our sorrows, our difficulties, but also our joys. And so thank you for the class that we have and the teaching that we have and the fellowship that we have in this class. Through Jesus Christ we pray, amen. I would just like to introduce my uh, dear friends, uh, Susan Coulter and Carol Brodigam, and they'd like to share so a message with you. <laughs> They're twins. Do you want me to say for you? <laughs> In Frankville, 30 years. Give me a talk. Do you want to say for her? Okay. Okay. Good morning. Um, we came to show with Thera about our, our California Deaf Women's Conference that we had two weeks ago here at our church. Um, the Deaf Church does this women's conference every two years, and we invite speakers from out of town to come, and we invite Deaf women from all over the state of California to join us for this event. Um, this year we had a speaker come from Canada, and um, she was a very popular speaker. So um, people enjoy having new faces come. Um, we know everybody throughout the state of California, so it's nice to have somebody come from outside. Um, we had 88 women in attendance, and that is one of our biggest conferences. Um, it was very, very successful conference. Um, on Friday night, we have fellowship and registration for people who come early, and we had almost everybody show up on Friday night. Uh, Saturday, we start early in the morning. We have like a continental breakfast, and then speakers all morning, then lunch, and then speakers after lunch until about 3.30. I think we stopped about 3.30. Then everybody has a break. In the evening, we have a banquet, and um, we did the banquet, banquet off campus. Um, and it's a little bit farmer, and the men in our ministry took care of the banquet. So they brought in all the food and set up everything for us and served the women during the banquet. And this is a night of fellowship, and uh, people volunteer to sign songs for the group, and it's really um, a really nice um, social time for women. Um, it's really special to have deaf women from Southern California, Sacramento, the Bay Area come down for our conference because we know each other, but we don't see each other very often. So anytime there's a conference or a retreat, we all try to get together and get caught up with each other. Um, 
from Fresno, we had how many scholarships? Twelve. We had twelve women locally that were able to come because of scholarship money, and some of that you were able to provide for us. So thank you so much for sponsoring our conference. We also had about 10 other women locally that attend other churches that have other deaf ministries, and they joined us for our conference, plus all the women from our church were here. So locally, we probably had about 30 women that attended from Fresno Clovis area. Um, we also decided because some of the local women had difficulty coming because of they have children, we decided for the first time to provide child care during the conference so that the local ladies could come. We did not offer that for women that came from out of town. So um, how many women benefited from that? Maybe about four about four women. So it was a small group, but still that's four women that were able to come that would not have been able to come otherwise. Anything else? I just want to add that as part of our church's goal to bring more people to follow Jesus, that's why we wanted to encourage local women who don't regularly attend or periodically attend our church and we were I feel like we were pretty successful with that but the other thing is we need to continue that and encourage them to continue coming and I did talk with one woman and one issue with her during the conference one issue was transportation and she found a friend to give her a ride every day but it was like on the other side of town and then over to church for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So through the scholarship money, I was able to give her gas money as well. Anything that would get them here is what our goal was. And I spoke with her afterwards. I said, we'd really like to see you come on Sundays. She said, money is the issue to be able to come with transportation. So we're going to be heading over to our deaf church leadership meeting um, after we finish here. And that's something that I'm going to bring up because I know that's an issue with other women and families as well. One of the barriers for getting them over to church is transportation. So hopefully we can work on that issue on going. So we really want to thank you again for your support. We appreciate it beyond what we can even say. Thank you so much. Beautiful silver-haired lady right there. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as you look at the picture that's up there, you see the little microphone. Uh, yes, I weigh, I'm a retired radio disc jockey and 40 years. And you probably heard me on KMJ, Kiss Country, KNAX, K Fresno, uh, Y94, uh, just a lot of stations around the valley. And my radio name was Dick Lyons, Shawn Michaels, and Josh Stevens. I'm the only disc jockey that ever worked at three different radio stations at the same time using different names. <clears throat> I had to have little cue cards in front of me so I'd know where I was at the time. So it was very interesting. Anyway, what I'd like to do this morning is have you go back to 1930, 1940, and the 1950 when you were young. I want you to remember how it was listening to a Motorola, RCA Victor, or a little Felco. Felco, very good, or a little transistor radio that you'd put on your bedpost. You had to use your imagination. You didn't see TV, you didn't see pictures, you had to use your imagination. And so as a radio disc jockey, when I write my stories that I've been doing now for about 15 years, I do it with the frame of mind that you have to look inside your mind to picture what I'm talking about. So the question that I have for today is doing something great for God good enough? Here's the question. Why would you merely throw away your life just doing something great for God 
Why great when God can have you do something impossible? Matthew 14, 13 through 21 is about Jesus feeding the 5,000. I would call this impossible with only two fish and five loaves of bread. From Matthew, when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the nearby towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, Christ said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. He then gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men, not counting the women and children. You have to realize that Christ is in a period of mourning for his cousin John the Baptist. He sought solitude after he received this news. He did not have time to dwell on the news, but continued with his ministry. Jesus performed some miracles as signs of his identity. He used other miracles to teach important truths. But here we read that he healed people because he had compassion on them. Jesus was and is a loving, caring, and feeling person. When you are suffering, remember that Jesus hurts with you. He has compassion for you. Jesus multiplied the five loaves and two fish to feed over 5,000 men who were present besides women and children. Therefore, the total number of people Jesus fed could have been ten to 15,000 people. The number of men is listed separately because in the Jewish culture of the day, men and women usually ate separately when in public. The children ate with the women. This was Mission Impossible 1. And now, let's look at Mission Impossible 2. Matthew 14, 22 through 32. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side. While he dismissed the crowd, after he had dismissed them, he went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. It was three o'clock in the morning, and the boat was being tossed back and forth. The wind was hitting from all sides. Normally, you would steer into the wind to avoid problems, but the problems were already there. Verses 25 and 26, during the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It was a ghost, and they all cried out in fear. The disciples were crying, screaming, and yelling in fear, grown men afraid of what had come upon them in the lake. Verses 27 through 28, but Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have, you have little faith. Christ said, why did you doubt? And when they had climbed back in the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. Understand at this point, all twelve of the disciples could have asked to walk with Christ. Six could have asked. Three could have asked. But only one, and that was Peter, who asked. Dr. David Gibbs, Jr. is an attorney and an evangelist. A sermon he preached goes along so well with the impossible mission. 
He was traveling at night with a black preacher on their way to a revival meeting. Being late at night, they had plenty of time to talk. The preacher told Dr. Gibbs, I asked God for the impossible. I asked God to allow me to lead at least one soul a day to his glory. So for the past seven years, I have had the honor of doing so. Dr. Gibbs couldn't believe what he was hearing. He had never heard of a, such a thing. Knowing who this wonderful pastor was and knowing he wouldn't lie to him, asked him how he did this. I asked God, the preacher replied. This is what Peter did getting out of the boat. He asked to do the impossible. Every midnight, my soul patrol day starts. And since it's about 1 a.m., we will be stopping for gas soon, and that might be the place. Shortly, the two pulled off the freeway into a mega neon-lit gas court. As they were driving to a pump, the pastor turned to Dr. Gibbs and said, there's a girl behind that counter inside their store. She might be the one. After filling up their car, the two men entered the area to get coffee and pay for the gas. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, the pastor turned to the young woman and said in a loud voice, ma'am, you and I may have an appointment you don't know about. God may have sent me to keep you out of hell. In five hours when the sun comes up, and if the choice came up, either heaven or hell, where would you go? There was a short pause, and this young lady reached behind the counter and brought up a Bible. She said, after 11 years working here, I have been praying to God to allow me to tell that to someone. Then a small voice behind Dr. Gibbs said, she knows where she is going, but I don't. I was at my mother's deathbed and couldn't acknowledge where I will be. The pastor turned back to the young clerk and said, right place, wrong person. The pastor turned to the woman standing in the line and said, you and I have a meeting here right now. At that point, another woman had walked inside and saw what was transpiring and wanted prayer also. On the bare tile floor, they all knelt and started praying. The two ladies who were asking to be saved, and then two men walked in and seen what was going on, asked if this was a stick-up, and the black pastor looked at them and said, Yes, it was. I just robbed Satan of two souls. <laughs> One of the men stated that for the last hour, they had been talking about this same subject. Will you pray for me also, he asked. Dr. Gibbs witnessed an impossible mission, something so impossible that it could have only come about through the Holy Spirit. The second condition for walking on water doing the impossible is that you must ask God for the impossible, not ask for conditions to be changed. The impossible is God's plan A. God doesn't need a plan B. An altar call was being given after a revival and a young petite girl named Marcy came forward to Dr. Gibbs and asked for a hug and a prayer. I would like you to say a special prayer for me. You see, I'm going to Malaysia to be a missionary. There have been none for 11 years because they keep disappearing. These people are cannibals and no one has gone. I asked for what you talked about, the impossible. And I'm going, she said. The young girl's parents came up and tried to have Dr. Gibbs talk their daughter out of going. But she had her mind set. So a helicopter was arranged to drop her off in Malaysia and then return in 60 days to pick her up. Even on her way there, the pilots tried to talk her out of going, but to no avail. So after 60 days, the helicopter flies over the area, and there is little Marcy. With over 70 tribes people, she helped to lead to the Lord. What nobody knew was that this tribe only eight men, <laughs> not women. Marcy had an open door for leading them to the Lord. The conditions had not changed. There was no plan B. It was because Marcy asked for the impossible, and God took care of everything else. The one thing Marcy remembered the helicopter pilot saying was, you won't be back. You will be dead, so don't go. Marcy looked at the pilot and said, 
I don't have to come back. I only have to go. The third condition for Peter walking on water, <clears throat> doing the impossible, was getting out of the boat. You ask God for the impossible, don't ask for conditions. Tell Christ your faith is in him and step out of the boat ready to do action. There are no conditions such as age, size, occupation that can stop you from doing the impossible and not just the great. Our God is not a God of great, but a God of the impossible. Dear Heavenly Father, as our minds and our hearts are looking to heaven towards you, Lord, we pray that we are always open for your leading and your guiding and for what you have planned for us. We just take the faith to ask you. Pray that you'll go with us today, be with us, abide with us, and keep us, both now and forevermore. Amen. Is there any, just, just because he's kind of new to the class here, you have any questions? I, I have a question. You told us, uh, you told me once that you and your wife were missionaries for years, some period of time. Two years we were missionaries, Kodiak, Alaska, for the Kodiak Baptist Missions. Uh, we took care of uh, the receiving home in the mission. And through our care for the two years we were there, we had uh, 60, 62 children come through our care. These were orphans abused children, wards of the court, all from Alaska, uh, all over the state of Alaska, and that we were able to clothe, take care of, feed, and kind of teach, and then take the doctors wherever they needed to go. So uh, we were there for two years, and it was uh, wonderful. My dad is a retired American Baptist preacher, um, and the uh, Selma is where basically one of his big churches was when he was there, and he was uh, in senior ministry. He took the seniors all over. Uh, they took a uh, tour of Canada. Uh, he also took them on a trip to the Holy Lands. Uh, my dad, uh, uh, very proud of, he's written three books on the end times, um, very knowledgeable about the end times, and he's always studying. Uh, it's hard for him to concentrate now because of his age, but um, he does the Bethel uh, Lutheran Home in uh, Selma, he does the ministry on Sunday afternoons, and he loves doing that, so preachers never retire, <laughs> which is sad. I am retired, though. Uh, it, you were talking about heart conditions. I've had a quadruple bypass. I've had a double bypass. I've had five stints. So uh, <clears throat> I should not be here. I already agree with the Lord. You can take me home. Apparently, he didn't want, want me to go yet. Uh, I always have the saying, You'll know when it's time to go when the Lord hangs your last picture in your mountain. And uh, so apparently my paintings aren't up on the wall yet. <laughs> uh, anything else? Anyone wanted to ask anything? What years were you doing the radio on Cain Okay, I started radio in 1968 in a little town called Porterville at K-Tip. Uh, that's where I started. I was going to college there. And then uh, went in the Army. I was in Vietnam for two years. Uh, well, not the whole time in two years, but I, uh, during the time I was in uh, Vietnam, came back, uh, met my wife in Spokane, Washington. Very strange story on that one. Sometime I'll have to tell you about it. Okay, uh, Monica, stand up. This is my wife, Monica. We've been married since 1973. Uh, we have three kids and eight grandchildren. So uh, it's been pretty nice. Uh, but I was a, uh, my dad asked me to go teach a Sunday school class at a friend's church. And I said, I just got back from Vietnam. I was just got home. He says, he asked me to do that. I said, oh, all right. I couldn't say no. So I went over there and this lady was there on a date. Uh, she came with a guy, yeah. But uh, I thought she was really cute. Well, she thought something too because she, I was only there for four Sundays, one month to teach there. And she came back the next three. And uh, so I, I didn't see her after that. And she saw my younger brother's name. She worked for the school district, saw my younger brother's name, and wrote the phone number down, which is not right. You can't do that. 
And she called me and asked me if I'd like to go bowling and join a bowling team with her and her parents. And so that's how we met. And then uh, eight, eight months later, One year from where we, when we met, we got got married. Yeah, six months of dating. So it wasn't a long course yet, and I'm still wondering if it's going to work. But, <laughs> so, but uh, we're, we wound up here. Our, our oldest son is an associate pastor in Adrian, Michigan. Uh, he has five children. Uh, I think it's the water back there. But uh, he's, uh, he's doing very good. And uh, our daughter... Uh, and granddaughter are staying with us right now, and then our uh, youngest son and his wife are getting ready to move to Adrian, Michigan, or Tennessee, <laughs> or Tacoma. Uh, they, their house is up for sale, and they're moving, so they aren't sure where they're going to go yet, but they're on their way. Hey, so Tom's question was, what years did you oh, work for yes. KMJ? Oh, I'm sorry, I got off. Um, <laughs> do you remember when the Kalinga earthquake hit? I was on the air at KMJ. It was like 5, 4, 4.30. In the, it was early in the morning. And, uh, and I was uh, monitoring this. I felt the earthquake. And all of a sudden, I'm on the phone to um, three of the uh, our newscasters and said, you've got to go out to Kalinga right now. And that's where it was. And so uh, we were live within, I think it took them 40 minutes to drive out there. And we were live, and we had New York, we had all the eastern stations calling, and so we were instant. It was that fast that it happened. So that tells you when I was at KMJ the, the first time. And then, I don't know if any of you remember Captain Scotty. Yeah. I worked with Captain Scotty. I was up in the helicopter. And, uh, were you in the helicopter when... No, I was not there when, when his helicopter came down. <laughs> and he, I, I think that's one of the reasons why he left, yeah. Yeah, it was in the water. Um, so, but uh, to tell you how old it was, I was working K-Make uh, just at the time when, um, let me think, uh, there's still the Stones, the Rolling Stones were in town, and we had them sitting on the floor in the studio. And uh, that was a long time ago. That was back in, in the 60s, that's when I started. And so from K-Make and then went into country, so I was with the country. I did mornings for a little station called Kino. So, so if, you're, if you remember Kino. And uh, then I decided uh, I was going to try something really weird. So there was a uh, Magic 104. I don't know if that one rang a bell. That was not very long. But then I went with the Country Camel. And I was with Country Camel when Pappas decided to turn it into news talk. And so from the K-Make News, I went over to the Pappas News and I was doing the ag reports. And my biggest one was a friend of mine. I was able to interview Fess Parker, and uh, that went national. And uh, my wife and family, we got to go over to Fess's uh, grand opening of his uh, winery, uh, his winery at Los Olivos. And he had a little group there called Sawyer Brown that was entertaining. And uh, it's, my daughter went nuts because she got to meet all of these people. Uh, Alan Jackson was here. Uh, we went on his bus. My daughter was taking everything, piece of paper she could find out of her <laughs> pocket to have him autograph it. So kind he did that. Yes? No, no, no. Alan Jackson was here in Fresno. Uh, the, the winer was Sawyer Brown. That, that was years ago when Fess was having a grand opening. But uh, a lot of the country acts that were here, uh, my daughter couldn't wait for someone to come to town so she could go with me. So she, yes, she got to meet uh, all these famous people. And the, the biggest star I got to meet that I really liked was that uh, when I worked at Channel 24 was Robert Vaughn. Uh, he had a collection of Man From Uncle books. And I, I had my son come down with two of them and he, he autographed him for me. Uh, very nice gentleman, very nice. But uh, So were you a Christian during this whole time? or So during all these times that you worked for these radio stations? So. Yes. Good. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, it's been an amazing ride. Uh, the only time I had any problems was when I was in Vietnam. And I'd already, always told my dad, said, 
God had a rope around me, and he'd only let me go so far, and then he'd yank it. So uh, I made it through. Nam came back home, and Lord turned my life around, and that's why I was able to meet such a lovely lady. And uh, it's been fun. So it's been interesting. All right. Well, Richard, thank you very much for sharing. Thank you. So he has written many stories. In fact, he told me that he loves studying the women of the Bible. So if you're ever interested, I'm sure he'd be happy to share those with you. And um, so thank you again for sharing today, Richard. That was great. Or Dick or whatever your name actually is. Thank you, Lord, for, uh, for who you are, that you are the God of this world. You are the, you are the leader and the God of our hearts. And... Be with us as we draw closer to you, and thank you for the time that we've had to share with one another, and um, just be with us today as we go. Keep us safe and and, uh, continue blessing us, and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.